Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our Mercer Chicago office wealth, which includes our investments and retirement practices um, information session. So we're super excited to have you here today and really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, shout out to some of the schools that have uh, are represented on today's call. We do have a nice intimate group today, so we hope that you will take yourself or put yourselves, your camera on so we can see your beautiful faces and keep this uh, an engaging presentation for all of us. Um, so my name is Michaela Seward. I am the campus recruiter for uh, Mercer for the central market, which is most of the Midwest offices with the exception of Texas. And I also manage the recruitment efforts in Atlanta and Charlotte. So as the campus recruiter, I'm kind of your main point of contact as it relates to um, the recruitment process. Um, and so you can always feel free to reach out to me with any questions uh, that you might have related to that um, off after this call. So um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, one, all of your lines should be muted currently, so do your best to keep those lines muted while the presentation is going on. However, when we get to the point of Q&A, you're welcome to come off mute and ask your questions verbally, or also feel free to put those questions in the chat box, and we'll be monitoring that as well throughout the presentation. Um, session is being recorded, um, and so with that, um, just keep that in mind. The presentation will be shared with you after this call. I will be following up with everyone who is registered. So you will get a link to the presentation, which will be housed on our Mercer campus YouTube channel. Um, so you will be able to reference this at a later time too, if you need to, or if you need to run early, you'll get the full recording um, after the call. Um, as I mentioned already, please feel free to turn on your cameras. And again, um, don't hesitate to put questions in the chat feature throughout the presentation as you think of them. Um, there will be a formal time to ask questions um, during our panel presentation, but always feel free to enter them in the chat as we go. So um, now I'm going to kick it over to Beth kirk Malecki. She is the office leader for the Chicago office. She's a um, client relationship manager as well, and one of the partners here at the firm. Um, she works closely with her team of nearly 500 professionals to drive Mercer's brand in Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, Beth also manages several key client relationships, and in addition to being responsible for developing consulting talent. So Beth? Thank you, Michaela. So hello everyone, as Michaela shared, I oversee our Illinois and Wisconsin markets. It's really a pleasure to be here talking with you today. Thought I'd share a little bit of background about me. I grew up in a small town um, in Southwest Michigan. I went to University of Michigan, um, so go blue for any Michigan uh, students out there. I'm a diehard fan and I am pretty excited that um, we may just have a, a football season after all. Um, I started my career as a retirement actuary. So um, once I graduated, I continued on with exams. I got my fellowship of the Society of Actuaries, um, did that for several years. And then I went down a major career change and I moved from being an actuary into client management. And what that means is exactly what Michaela said. It is, I'm responsible for the overall relationship across all the service areas that Mercer provides um, to, our, to our clients. And I've been now doing that for 20 plus years. Um, now I've been at Mercer nine years and uh, part of my job is to oversee our, and my main job is to oversee the Chicago and Milwaukee offices. Um, and I've been doing that for about six years. And then from a personal perspective, because I think it's helpful to, to, for everyone to see the person as a whole, um, I am married, I have two children, I have a 15 year old daughter and a 13 year old son both of whom are doing e-learning um, and currently 100% e-learning, although I heard last night that my son in middle school may be doing a hybrid soon. Um, so my job today is to talk about Mercer more broadly, um, who we are as a company, and so let's start on that on the next page. So we are part of Marsh and McLennan companies, or MMC. So 
MMC has over 17 billion in revenue. We're in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have more than 75,000 colleagues worldwide. And there are four primary companies that make up the MMC family. First, Mercer, which we are a global leader in talent, health, retirement, and investment consulting. And we help clients advance the health, wealth, and the careers of their people in, in, their, in the performance of their people. Um, Marsh is our counterpart on the risk side. So they help companies with their insurance broking, risk management, really trying to help companies quantify what is the risk, anticipate the risk, and have a plan um, to um, mitigate against risk. Oliver Wyman is our management consulting business. So this, um, their main competition are like McKinsey's of the world, and they are helping clients with their organizational um, challenges, strategy, operations, risk, the overall transformation of the business and what the business needs to look like as a whole. And then Guy Carpenter is the MMC reinsurance business. So they work primarily with insurance companies on reinsuring the risk. Uh, the next slide, if you go to that one, um, shows Mercer's executive leadership team. And I think this is really um, a great way to just help you guys have an idea of um, our focus and our um, appreciation of how important it is to have a diverse and inclusive culture. You'll see that our CEO, um, she's phenomenal, is female. Um, and we are very proud to say that we have a female CEO. Our CFO is also female. Our chief technology officer is also female. Um, and so it's, a, it's for a leadership team. Um, and we would never say we're done on our diversity uh, path. We have a lot more work to do. Um, but we have uh, the right commitment from, a, from the very top of the house, which is fantastic. And so on the next slide, because we're here to learn about Mercer's wealth business, this helps you see how that business fits into the picture I showed you of the four operating companies. So you see Mercer on the slide, and then we have our health business, our wealth business, and our career business, as well as M&A, which really touches all of them. And the other business that really touches all health, wealth, and career is our international consulting business. And I, I would also put that as a business along the bottom like M&A. So it just kind of helps you see how everything fits together. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, this really talks about how, you know, this dives a layer deeper and it summarizes the services that we provide to our clients across the health, wealth, and career and M&A spectrum. Um, our focus is on shaping the future of our clients. And we really try to consider the economic and the human impact at every step along the way. And I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail on wealth because Dan Cutleroff, our leader of that business, um, will be covering that shortly. But on the health side, you can see that we do things like benefit, benefit strategy and design. Um, we have an administration solution. We help clients with um, their pharmacy and their um, life absence and disability benefits. So also the whole host of anything related to health and benefits we help clients both with the design, the financing, the funding, the strategy, everything related to benefits. And that's also true for wealth on the retirement side. And then from a career standpoint, this is a very diverse business. I mean, there are things such as compensation consulting, communications, um, helping clients with their change management. What's their digital strategy? So we help clients with their overall human capital management system that they use um, to manage their people. Um, and we do uh, implementations of Workday. So it's a very diverse business with a lot of facets, exec comp. Um, and um, some of you may have joined one of those sessions earlier where we talked about the career in the health business. And then finally, M&A. Um, we help organizations. If you think about a merger or an acquisition, um, a big part of the synergy of the deal is often related to people. And we help the client with those people aspects, all of the benefit programs, all of their investments. How do they set the, the company up to ensure that they are going to have, get the synergies out of the deal that they need? So that's another area of our consulting. Okay, so then on the next slide, we talk about what, what really makes Mercer unique. Um, 
So if you, if you start in the upper left corner quadrant, um, you see two circles. And right there, it shows that Mercer really brings together the people and the performance aspects. Um, we fuse economics and empathy to really maximize impact for our clients. And that's what makes us unique. That's what makes us special. And in a year like 2020, fusing empathy and economics has never been more critical. So in, we really exist in order to make a difference in people's lives. And our colleagues live by four commitments. Always bring a point of view. So we can bring a client options, but at the end of the day, we need to advise our clients and, and tell them what we think is the best approach based on our knowledge of the situation as well as the client. We need to deliver the whole firm. So today we're talking about wealth, and that's one aspect of our firm. But when a client, when we're in helping them solve a problem, it's very often the case that just one area of Mercer and our services is not the only thing that needs to be solved. Often we need to bring other experts to this table to be able to ensure that we're solving the problem holistically. And we really, that's one of our commitments. The, the third one is boldly shape the future. So um, we need to be on the forefront of bringing ideas to our clients really shaping the way things are going to change um, and what we need to do as a firm and as clients and all, all of our collective learnings to really drive a better future um, for, and this is, it sounds crazy, you know, it sounds very lofty, but it's true. If we're gonna make a difference in people's lives and we have to be driving innovation, driving new ideas, thinking outside the box to boldly shape that future. And then finally, we need to execute well. So you can have big, grandiose ideas, but if you can't, if you can't um, have uh, the rubber meet the road, it's really not very effective. So we really have to have top-notch project management, um, leading the client through change, really helping them along every step of the way to make sure steps are not missed. And we need to execute with um, a very strategic point of view. Mercer has the size and scale on the next slide to really build a brighter future for our clients. Um, we have, we serve 82% of the Fortune 500. We have over 25 colleagues, 25,000 colleagues, excuse me. We deliver services Mercer specifically. I'm not talking MNC anymore. It's, you know, these are Mercer stats here in over 140 countries. And, you know, we serve more than 30,000 clients. We have 5 billion in revenue. And I think the next two stats are really important specifically for the wealth business. When it comes to um, investment space, there's, we're second to none. So we have over $12 trillion in assets under advisement. And we have over 265 billion in assets that where the company has delegated the authority to manage their assets on their retirement assets on their behalf. So assets under advisement, we're advising the client on those investments. Assets where it's delegated to us, we've taken control over those assets and are investing them on our client's behalf. Those numbers, we're, we're number one in both category. There's no, no competition um, even close. So really, really strong stats on the board there. On the next slide, we talk about, um, our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and it often comes up, you know, why do I work at Mercer? What's important to me? And, and I'm very proud to say that Mercer is very committed to DE&I with our own colleagues and as a firm, but also externally. So in leading our clients through this DE&I journey as well. Um, from the diversity perspective, we're focused on how our workforce is evolving. Like, how are we making sure that we're evolving our representation, ensuring our workforce represents the communities that we serve and represent? And then from an equity perspective, this is about ensuring colleagues receive equitable rewards for their work and not just equitable rewards, but also access to career progression opportunities as they come up. And then finally, from an inclusion perspective, how well does our culture our um, environment and the experience really instill a sense of belonging, authenticity, authenticity and trust. I mean, these are all critical items to really have 
um, an environment where we're fostering belonging for all colleagues. On the next slide, what I will share is this just goes a little deeper on inclusion in a culture of inclusion. And we really believe that every, that our company's greatest strength is the collective talent of our people. Um, I, I said this, I've get, you, used this example a few times, but you know, if you think of any, any team, um, you can take a basketball team, you can take a football team. You know, if you only have an offensive line and no defense, you're not a good team. You're not going to win the game. You know, your offense may be able to score points, but the, you know, defense has nothing. So you don't have any defensive players. You're just going to get all score you know, the points scored back on you. Or in soccer, you have to have people who's you know have a good left foot and a good right foot, because if you only have one, you're you're falling short. So you need people of all different backgrounds, experiences, um, and skills. And our lifelong experiences count in that um, diversity of team and how important and valuable it is. So our strength, our greatest strength is the collective talent of our people, no one individual. You need individuals, but you need the team. And we really try and seek when we're um, looking for colleagues to join Mercer, we seek capable, creative, and fair-minded people. So we welcome people who are open to finding new ways, smarter ways, and really help our shared enterprise thrive. And for inclusion, um, for us, it means a lot more than just acceptance, it means belonging. So um, the promise of full participation in the life and work of our company and a voice in its future. And every person um, we believe at our company has unique knowledge and experience that they bring to the table and that is incredibly valuable. On the next slide, um, we talk a little bit about our business resource group. So this is another thing I love about Mercer. Um, this is a great way to get involved in the office, meet other people, support something for which you have passion. Our BRGs host events for all colleagues, ra ranging from anti-racism, ally events for, um, with our racial and ethnic diversity BRG, to US Good Week, where it's a week of volunteering being hosted by our Mercer Cares Business Resource Group, to the Pride BRG, who's currently sponsoring um, a team for our Chicago AIDS Walk. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to get involved in the office, and the BRGs are a great way to do so, um, both in participation and in membership and in leadership. So, in rising professionals, I mean, I don't want to leave any of these off, they're all great. Rising professionals, um, a lot of newer colleagues join this. It's a way to meet people in other lines of business, broaden your network, hear about things that people are doing, um, but really a great way to make lifelong friends. Um, in, our, in the next slide, specifically um, in our office, oh, I, should, I should mention, this says Shiwaki. Um, Shiwaki means uh, it's our, our affectionate term for Illinois, and it's Shiwaki, Chicago and Milwaukee. So um, we don't use that externally, but it's internally what we call ourselves, and it's just our affectionate term for Chicago plus Milwaukee. Um, so the next couple slides talk about some things we're doing locally. And, you know, during COVID, uh, you know, um, this is really hard to stay connected when we're all working remotely. And so we, we have to work extra hard, but I think we've been pretty effective. We started some new things. So we celebrate our colleagues' good news. And so each week we send out an email to the office. Um, you'll see a bunch of pictures here. We have had all sorts of things happening during COVID. We've had babies born. We've had people get married. We have had graduations. We've had uh, family outings. We've had silly pranks being pulled. We've had vacations. And you can see it all represented in these pictures where colleagues are sharing, um, you know, pets adopted, what, whatever their good news is, we create a little story and we share it with the office. And it's a fun way, frankly, for when you have over 500 colleagues to still stay connected and get to know one another. Um, we also did an event uh, for our um, new hires this year. So recent college hires, as you know, they didn't get a college, many of them didn't get a college graduation. So we held um, a virtual commencement ceremony, and um, it was honestly a great way for this uh, big group of new hires to meet one another, start to get to know one another, 
and start to build those relationships as well as you know celebrate a very um big moment in their lives so that was a lot of fun and then you know we did things like for pride month um our pride brg um did some trivia for folks they hosted trivia events and we also you know have a focus on our well-being and so we've had um, a get moving challenge in the spring slash winter where we were um you know we had weekly fitness challenges that you could participate in and i'll tell you there's nothing like a contest to get people um participating so um and now we just finished our step challenge so um you know it was a walking challenge and who could get the most steps during that time so it's amazing how many steps people get during a step challenge it just absolutely blows my mind um but just a lot of fun unique ways you got to get creative um, when you're all working remote on the next slide um yeah i wanted to just share this this dives a little deeper locally about our racial and ethnic diversity brg they put together a roadmap on um, with their plan for this year. And they started it with, um, they're hosting five, it's a series, five anti-racism ally sessions on five different topics. And um, we've done two so far, really well attended, really great sessions, um, really just helping build awareness and appreciation and really trying to open um that awareness to systemic inequities that are based on race and privilege um, they also were looking at sponsorship programs so pairing new diverse and underrepresented hires with colleagues at a higher level um, as well as we're looking at a reverse mentorship program so um, you know where we would pair some very senior decision makers at mercer with bipoc colleagues um, to drive key decisions that are beneficial for all racial and ethnic um, groups, which is really great. And then big piece of us, this is who we are, is giving back to the community. Um, it really is fundamental to our mission and our culture. And so what are those new and creative ways that we can engage and support the local community in our efforts? So that's just a, an example of one of the local BRGs and, and what our areas of focus are. Um, so the next slide, I think I'm going to be turning it over, yep, to Dan Kotleroff, who leads our um, wealth line of business for Illinois and Wisconsin. And um, Dan, I'm thrilled to pass it to you. Okay, thanks, Beth. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, um, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Great to have you on here. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple of minute a little bit more of a deeper dive into the wealth business and really as an introduction for our panel discussion. So in a few minutes, I'll be leading a panel discussion with three of our analysts uh, that cover different parts of the wealth business. So that's really gonna give you all a good flavor for what it's like to work in the wealth business every day, what it's like to grow up there, how they've started their career coming from internships, uh, new hires into the analyst roles they're into today. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you a little bit of an overview in the wealth business. The wealth business is basically where we help make the financial lives of our clients better now and in the future. And our clients in the wealth business are basically retirement plans. And there's lots of different ways that companies provide retirement plans these days. And they're large asset pools. So they could be endowments or foundations of universities, for example, that you guys attend. If anybody is a benefit of a scholarship from a university endowment, it's very possible that we are helping that endowment, that university manage the endowment's assets so that you and your peers and your children in the future can benefit from that. We work with hospital systems to help them manage their asset pools. Um, so that they can continue to provide community services. We work with charitable foundations uh, to make their communities better, make the world a better place. So it's a really, um, it, it, for me personally, it's a really way, it's a good way to feel like you're impacting our world. It's a way to feel like you're giving back, you're trying to help, help helping to make the world a better place and helping everybody eventually be able to, uh, to retire in a way that provides them with the financial well being that they're seeing. So that's what wealth does in a nutshell. A little bit of a deeper dive, there's, there's generally two, two buckets of technical kind of skills that we look to hire in the wealth space. There's on the investment side, 
Uh, and those are typically people that bring a finance and or economics and business background. And we'll talk about how we bring those uh, skills to bear. And then there's the actuarial side, which is uh, a math and statistics focus. So Bill, if you, if you hit the next slide here, um, on the investment side, so this is the first of the two skills I mentioned, we, we at, a, at the highest levels, our investment consultants focus on three areas. They either do the research, they sort of dig deep into the markets and the different economies out there and all the different asset managers out there and research all those managers, whether they're equity managers, fixed income managers, private equity, uh, hedge fund managers, and really do a deep dive into the markets and the different managers out there. Um, we provide advice to our clients. So a lot of our consultants are working directly with our clients, giving them advice on how to set up their retirement programs, how to set up and manage their endowments and foundations that I mentioned. And then the third piece is on the solutions front. We have a lot of our clients that have basically come to us and said, Hey Mercer, I don't I don't have the the bandwidth or the internal staff to do all this myself. Can you do it for me? So manage the assets for me. Go out and pick all the managers and make those selections for me on my behalf. So those are the different ways that that we provide our services. And you'll hear in a couple of minutes from some of our investment folks, uh, Bill and and Megan, how we how they. Uh, help to to provide both that advice and research underneath here you see the different types of ways that we provide some of those services investment strategies asset allocation due diligence on managers operational execution and administrate administration so those are all the different types of things we, we bring to our clients uh, bill next slide a little bit of a deeper dive on the investment consulting front where this is where a lot of our analysts spend their time on what is it that they actually do what does the process look like you think about it in terms of four steps how we work with our clients and this is true with our clients whether they're retirement plans or whether they're endowments foundations operating assets whatever they may be we first bring them recommendations around how they should be investing those assets, how much risk they should be taking versus how much reward they wanna get from it. We work directly with those clients and really have an informed collaborative approach centered around education. And really people throw around the term extension of staff. Um, that's really what it feels like when you've got good client relationships where you feel like you work for that client. So it's a very collaborative approach with that client, which takes us into step number three, a lot of engaging interactive discussions with our clients until eventually together we reach a decision and a feedback with them. So it's a really very involved process that our, that our investment consultants follow. Uh, so next slide, Bill. The other skill set I mentioned is on the actuarial side. Um, and our actuaries and our investment consultants work side by side together to make sure we are managing the assets and the investment risk appropriately, while at the same time, understanding how much these benefits cost. What are these benefits going to cost in the future? How much cash do companies need to uh, fund for these benefits? And that's what our actuarial work does. Our actuarial consultants, they spend a lot of time helping our retirement clients design what kind of a retirement uh, program should we be offering? What's the best way to financially manage that? Um, we calculate you know, the, the benefits for almost 2 million participants. We manage over $400 billion in liabilities for these plans. Um, we help them manage the risk. Some companies have looking for better ways to manage that risk. And so we help them work with insurance companies to manage that. Um, all ways that, that our actuaries work directly with our clients, a little bit uh, sort of one layer deeper, the kinds of actual projects they would work on if you hit the next slide, Bill. Um, we talked about how they design those retirement plans, making sure that they're appropriate uh, in terms of when companies set up their retirement plans and making sure they're, they're competitive with their, with their peers. Beth talked earlier about how we help our companies go through mergers and acquisitions. Um, believe it or not, there are some companies out there where the size of their retirement plans are bigger than the company itself. So it's a huge financial um, element and that's, that factors into things like um, when, when they're looking to make acquisitions or be bought by somebody else. Um, so a, a lot of these terms may not mean a lot to you today, uh, but this is a lot of the actuarial work. And the reason the actuarial work is so, is so critical 
is a retirement plan is out into the future. And it's hard to say today, well, what's my cost gonna be in 40 years? How do I know how long people are gonna live? How much are they gonna get paid? Are they still gonna be working for the company? How much money is, am I gonna earn over those next 40 years? That's a lot of those actuarial concepts that come into play over the next 40 years that we help our companies to plan for, plan for that uncertainty and, and best manage that risk. Next slide, Bill. Um, some of the things that, some of the benefits, the advantages of, of working in our wealth group at Mercer, um, you are never, as, as Bill and, and Megan and Jordan will probably tell you, you're never working on one thing at a time. Um, and that makes it exciting, that makes it challenging. Um, there's always multiple projects that, that you're juggling and no two projects are the same. Um, you, could work for the, you could work on the same project for four different clients and each of those clients has very different objectives so the project will feel very different. So that keeps it fun and exciting and challenging. You get to work with a lot of different senior consultants and, and um, learn from them and, and develop those skills. It's very much a people business. Um, even in this virtual environment we're all in these days, lots of Zoom meetings, lots of calls, working um, virtually side by side with our peers. It's pretty fast paced. Um, our clients often need something yesterday and, and they'll call us and, and tell us that. And so we've got to be nimble and we've created a lot of innovation to help our clients move faster. Beth talked earlier about how we delegate, clients delegate uh, investment management authority to us. That was something very few companies did 10 years ago and we spent a lot of time innovating there to help our clients and, and help them be more nimble. Um, you'll hear from our colleagues in a minute, but I'll tell you my personal story. I spent 17 years at Mercer and then I left for three and a half before I came back. And the reason I came back was I missed our colleagues. I missed the challenge. I missed the dynamic consulting environment. I went to work for an asset management firm um, and I didn't get to experience that same kind of dynamics and the engagement that you get from, from some of our great colleagues. Um, and you know, intellectual capital, we have to be bringing ideas out to our clients. They depend on us for that. So we've got a lot of people that their primary focus is generating new ideas, generating intellectual capital, putting the technical um, ideas into something actual tangible that we could bring out to clients. As a result of all this, you get to grow in a lot of different ways. Uh, you get to be involved in new business opportunities. You get to work with our health business, our career business, our M&A business. Um, and you really build up a lot of strong business skills in a, in a short period of time when you're so client focused, especially in a, in a field like this, which is so financially based. Um, understanding, getting back to Beth's original point, how we fuse economics, which is so much of the financial cost of these retirement plans and investment pools, fusing that with, the, with empathy and working with our clients to understand what's important to them and how to bring that to them. Um, is just a real lot of a lot of growth areas. Next slide, Bill. Okay, so I'm going to turn it to Michaela, um, who will touch on the recruiting process, and then we'll get back and, and set up our panel. Thanks, Dan. So, how do you guys get to join this awesome, wonderful company? Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you can see on this slide, which I'll touch on in just a minute, but. Um, some of the some of the skill sets, majors, requirements that we're looking for. Um, but I will be candid with you uh, because there's still a lot of uncertainty in the world right now as it relates to business um, and COVID and what the future of work will be. Uh, we're still waiting on and working on our our 2021 uh, college hiring forecast. So we're hoping to have that wrapped up here in the next month or so. Um, but right now, you probably won't find too many positions posted for Mercer opportunities in Handshake or your other school systems at this time, um, but they will be coming. And that's part of the reason why we're having these conversations with you now is to introduce you to our opportunities, to our amazing colleagues, um, and get you excited about wanting to come here. And um, when we, and now that we have your information via the registration form, we'll absolutely be reaching out to all of you, letting you know when those positions are active in Handshake and on our website. And so you will be aware and able to um, apply at that point in time um, as soon as that happens. Um, so what are we looking for and what can you expect from our process? Um, all of our early career positions and intern 
in internships, um, they start out as analysts for the most part. Um, so we're looking for people that have strong analytical um, skills, but also strong communication skills. Obviously, as a consulting firm, we interact with clients regularly. So being able to communicate effectively is extremely important there. Um, and in terms of technical experience and knowledge, um, having a, a, a well-rounded understanding of both Excel and PowerPoint, which are two applications that we tend to use very often in our day-to-day -day work, um, is important. So um, school sometimes doesn't provide a ton of opportunity to learn those skills in depth, but there are a lot of options on um, the internet for you to build those skills um, over time while, while you're in school. Um, and that will help you greatly in a role like this as you, as you graduate and move into one. Um, in terms of the, the minimum requirements we're looking for, uh, generally speaking, we're looking for a minimum 3.0 GPA on a 4.0 scale and permanent U.S. work authorization. Um, so that means citizenship or permanent residency, green card holders. Um, really the goal of our internship programs is to convert full-time or convert the, uh, the summer intern into a full-time hire upon graduation. And because we don't tend to sponsor at the early career level, um, we typically don't um, hire OPT or CPT students for internships. Um, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, we don't. Um, so that's why we require permanent U.S. work authorization. Um, as far as majors are concerned, we're actually pretty open. Um, as Dan mentioned, we do have an actuarial side of our business. So students who are on the actuarial track and taking exams, it's definitely um, one group of students that we're looking for for specific roles within wealth and health. Um, and outside of that, if you have analytical ability, if you have strong communication skills, you could be anywhere from an English major to a finance, to an econ, to an engineering major. We aren't going to discriminate based on major. We just want um, a strong, diverse workforce that can um, you know, bring creative thought, innovative thought, and uh, are able to kind of jump into the work that we do with a passion as Dan exudes um, for the work. So, um, so once you apply to a position, once we get to that step and um, you apply, you can expect to be contacted um, if we feel you're a good fit for the next step. And the next step is a, a higher view digital interview. So it's an on-demand one-way video interview, usually consisting of anywhere from eight to, or four to eight questions, um, roughly a 15 minute ordeal. Um, but you, and once you complete that interview, um, it'll be reviewed and we'll make selections on those that we want to bring in or talk to in a final round capacity. Um, those final rounds typically for most of the businesses consist of behavioral interviews. Um, within some of our practices, uh, we do have some case interviews or quantitative assessments along with it, but the majority um, are, are simply behavioral interviews. This year, given the circumstances, um, all of our interviews will be uh, virtual. So the final round will, however, be more in a live setting um, via Zoom, this platform, where you'll be interacting live with somebody um, or multiple people throughout the interview process. Um, and then from there, we would, you know, determine whether or not you receive an offer. Um, so the normal timeline, we would usually be doing final round interviews sort of mid to late October. That timeline could be pushed back just a little bit, but when we reach out to you, we will communicate kind of what to expect in terms of timing. Um, as we know, there's a bunch of different things going on in your life, so we want to make sure that you're fully aware of what to expect. Um, one question that tends to come up often is, is definitely around location. So um, obviously this call is specific to the Chicago office. We wanted to introduce you to people here and um, about, you know, so you can learn more about the culture and the teams here. Um, and while we hope that it's your interest to be in Chicago, we know that you may have an interest in another location. So I just offer a bit of advice from a recruiter. Um, when you're thinking about location, especially if you're in your internship phase um, and, you know, you just kind of want a job, you know, you want to work for this awesome company, but um, wherever they have an opening for you, that's great. I want to be there. Um, that is great. The enthusiasm is great, but you want to really think about where you want to be sort of three to five years down the line, because a lot of times it's really important to have a connection in the city that you're going to, 
um, so that you feel rooted and that you feel like you have support outside of work. Um, so as I mentioned, the goal of an internship is really to convert you to a full-time hire and ultimately the office where you intern wants to keep you. So that's why it's important as an intern to think about where you want to be and would you want to be in that city for a full-time job. Um, so, you know, it's easy to apply to every and all positions that you see on the website, but, you know, frankly, from a recruiter standpoint, it's more advantageous for you and more appealing to the recruiter for you to, to kind of focus on maybe one or two areas or locations that make sense for you. Um, and, and that way, you know, as long as you're transparent with your recruiter, we're able to help you facilitate um, those those movements um, and eliminate confusion throughout the process. Sometimes different locations bring along different recruiters, so we have to communicate with each other to make sure that you have the best experience throughout the process. Um, so anyway, that, that is what I have for you in terms of what we're looking for and what to expect in the coming weeks. Um, and I'm here to ha and happy to answer any questions, so you can put those in the chat now or I will be following up with an email, like I mentioned, um, after this with some additional resources for you and links to learn more about our culture. Um, so you can also reply to that if you have any questions or um, concerns along the way. So back to you guys, Dan. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Michaela. All right, here we go. A day in the life of Wealth at Mercer. So, uh, you know, I sort of gone a little backwards here. I jumped into my, um, overview of wealth before I gave you a, a, an introduction of myself. So let me give you a little bit more of an introduction uh, of myself and then I'll introduce my esteemed panel here. Um, so, so this is me, I've got uh, four children. Um, I grew up as an actuary, uh, went to school in New York, Queens College and um, growing up as an actuary, having kids pretty quick. If anybody out there is familiar with the actuarial exam process, I just took a long curvy path through that. Um, as I was trying to build my family at the same time, and here they all are. This is a recent picture when we traveled to Israel last year. Uh, the other two pictures here um, are indicative of, of some of my personal passions. If anybody knows those, uh, those face masks of me and my wife, those are uh, Fish, the, the music band. Um, and there's me in my tie-dyed onesie uh, playing guitar. My, my other hobby, I hide in the basement, put on my tie-dyed pajamas from the 70s and, and play guitar. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me. That's what I love to do. Um, anything that uh, you know, falls into the nerding out category, sign me up. Um, not to steal Bill's thunder, um, but you know, he and I exchange, uh, uh, you know, share our insights on reading uh, biographies, presidential biographies in particular. Um, so, uh, you know, if you like to nerd out a little bit, you're, you're talking to the right folks. So that's me. Uh, let me introduce my panelists. Um, we've got, I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, folks from the investment side and the actuarial side. Uh, Jordan Zimmel uh, comes to us from the actuarial side. Megan Coffey uh, from the investment side on the research element of that, and then Bill Terry on the investment side. So Jordan, let me kick it to you to give your uh, your intro. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, as a, kind of similar to Dan, I'm falling into the um, the actuarial um, side of things. So I'm I'm currently in in progress on um, taking all those exams that he was talking about, and I'm also kind of following in, in his footsteps of um, their family at the same time. I'm actually uh, my wife is due with our first kid this this January, so. Um, it's a very exciting time. Um, so a little more about me. I, uh, I went to school at the, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison here in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin's also my hometown. I grew up in a, a small farm town of Brown, called Brownsville, which is about an hour northwest of Milwaukee if you're driving. Um, if you're not from Wisconsin, there's probably a 0% chance that you know where that is. Um, and then some of my hobbies in my spare time, I enjoy um, traveling for um, that, that photo right there is me uh, and my wife um, at a, basically buy some rice patties in Bali. We went there for um, our one year delayed honeymoon, which was fantastic, would highly recommend it to everyone. Um, I enjoy hanging out with my cats. That's the, the rightmost photo up on top. I actually have one of them kind of sitting to the left of me here. She always likes listening to me on calls. Um, 
and then I also enjoy playing volleyball, snowboarding, um, and just doing home projects around the house and uh, doing uh, lawn work and stuff like that. I find that all very therapeutic. So I think I'll pass it off to Megan next for her introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Coffey and I'm an associate on the Hedge Fund Manager Research Team. Um, I interned with Mercer in the Chicago office the summer before my senior year. Um, and then I started full time after graduating from Villanova University. I majored in finance and accounting, so kind of the more traditional investment route. Um, and I actually started full time in the New York office. Um, but I am currently working from home in Wisconsin from my parents' house, um, which is what I will be doing indefinitely. And so even though I'm in the New York office, I go into the Chicago office frequently back when it was allowed. Um, and I really have very strong kind of Midwestern roots, both my siblings in the picture. My brother, he just graduated from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then my twin sister, um, she went to Northwestern. Um, so I hope to eventually come back to the Midwest. And my hometown is actually Shorewood, but I put Milwaukee because I'm so used to people from the East Coast not knowing where anything in Wisconsin is. Um, and outside of doing manager research and studying for the CFA, I like running, um, playing soccer, reading historical fiction, um, and planning trips for when we can eventually travel again. And then I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just because I know when I was a sophomore junior, I had no idea what investment manager research was. So I thought I'd just give like a 30 second background so you guys could ask me any questions um, on that topic if you had any. So I'm on the hedge fund manager research group. And so basically what my role entails is sourcing new investment strategies, performing full due diligence on strategies that will ultimately result in a rating. And then I help consultants like Bill and our institutional clients decide which hedge fund managers make sense in their portfolio depending on their risk and return goals and other constraints or targets that they may have. So Bill, on to you. Thanks, Megan. Uh, as, as Megan mentioned, uh, I am in the investment consulting track of this. Uh, so you know, more on the, uh, the client facing side, helping them, um, as Dan mentioned, I, I help with, you know, allocating assets and helping clients meet their return targets. Uh, I went to the school at the University of Notre Dame, which was quite the leap from a Southern California boy. Uh, I was born and grew up in a small beach town called Santa Barbara out in California, but decided that I, you know, beaches are overrated and why not go to the cold? So I moved out to the Midwest where I've, um, you know, been for uh, about four years now. And uh, if you see in the top right, I've got a picture of my fiance and my dog, which are two of my main hobbies. Uh, taking care of both of them in COVID has, uh, you know, been a, been a, almost a full-time gig in addition to work. Uh, and then uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm also a big reader. So very into reading biographies, into reading science fiction. Uh, and then the the last picture there would be uh, Crystal Palace. So that's a uh, English Premier League soccer team, which I support and I get up far too early to watch, uh, even though we're not exactly very good. So uh, that's a little bit about me and kind of what keeps me, me uh, busy outside of work. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Dan. All right. So uh, so you've here's your colleague that rep your panel that represents all parts of our wealth business on the both research on the investment side, client facing consulting on the investment side, and then the actuarial retirement side. So um, this session is for you guys to um, anything on your mind to understand what it's like to work at Mercer. Um, so like Michaela said, throw out any questions through the chat. Um, in the meantime, I am going to ask uh, the panel a few questions to, to, you know, while you guys are thinking about that. Um, but don't hesitate to uh, to throw any questions that are in your minds um, out there. This is this is for you to understand what it's like to to get jobs at Mercer and to work with Mercer. So um, let me start with, uh, you know, Megan. You mentioned that you started as an intern at Mercer, and I know I think Jordan, you also came as an intern. Um, Megan, why don't you start by talking about your experience when you came in as an intern 
and then how that progressed into you coming on board as a uh, full-time hire? Yeah, of course. So I started um, as an intern and it was a 10 week internship program and I was on the investment manager research team, but I was a generalist. So I sat across all asset classes and there were two of us on the manager research side and two of us on the consultant side. Um, so what Bill does, and that was actually really beneficial because we were able to go to each other's meetings and we really do work so closely with the field consultant side um, that it was helpful to gain exposure because maybe after my internship, I decided I was more interested in that. And so throughout the internship, honestly, a lot of my role was taking notes and sitting in on meetings. And to be honest, I probably understood half of what was being said. Uh, but I really appreciated that after every meeting, and there's usually two or three a day, um, the more senior members of the team would take half an hour to debrief myself and the other intern and let us ask any questions we wanted. And that was just such a huge learning experience for me. And I also was able to work on a few projects um, and some of them were longer term, so I didn't get to see them to completion, but they're really value add. They weren't just kind of mindless admin tasks. And so I really appreciated that. Um, and I guess, honestly, what the biggest thing that made Mercer stand out for me was at the end of my internship, I had an exit interview with my people manager. And um, he, we kind of had a very honest discussion and he let me know that he hoped to give me a full-time offer, but that if this wasn't what I wanted, that he would help me find something either within Mercer or outside of Mercer um, that would kind of fit what I wanted out of my career. And honestly, I just appreciated that so much that he was so involved in my professional development um, that he would help me with that rather, like, rather than saying, if you don't want Mercer, that's it, we cut up contact. Um, and so to be honest, when I was searching, I did want Mercer, but I obviously applied to other jobs because you want to make sure you're getting the best um, option. And he was very honest with me with helping me prioritize what I wanted um, and what I thought I'd be best at. And I ultimately decided to go with Mercer, but it was a unique situation for me because he was based in Chicago and I was based in New York. But I really think what made that relationship and my role successful was because we had that very honest level of communication. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Megan. Jordan, I wanna get your experiences, but before that, um, I just want to address the, the questions that came in. Um, some of the questions that came in. M Michaela, uh, I'm going to ask you to jump in on this one. There was a question, are internships only offered by your senior year or any year in college? Michaela, do you want to just talk about what year we typically recruit interns for? Yeah, sorry. I thought I, I should have mentioned that. Um, so yeah, internships, we typically look for rising seniors for our internships. Um, you definitely have to be in school and not graduated um, for an internship unless you're going, you know, after that summer, you're going back to get your master's or something or going on to further your education. Um, but usually it's to rising seniors only because, you know, our, our hope is that you want to come back to us full time the following year. Um, but I think, you know, in some cases we may be open to rising juniors as well. Um, but that's generally what, you know, what we look for. So I think that that uh, touches on the last, uh, the, the more recent question that came into about graduating in May 2021. Um, typically, we're not looking, you know, you would be eligible for full time hire at that point. We're not looking mm -hmm. for ships that have already, that are interns that have already graduated college. Um, one of the questions that came in, and I think this would be a good segue to hear uh, Jordan's experience was, uh, how can a statistics major apply into what Mercer does? What are typical things that person can do if they're an intern or full-time? So um, many of our actuarial um, consultants, our actuarial analysts have statistics backgrounds, a lot of an actuarial science degree, and a lot of the exams are sort of based and steeped in statistical concepts. Um, so the answer to that question is you can absolutely apply for a job on the actuarial side. You can also apply for a job on the investment side. We talked about, you know, economics, finance, business background. We're, we're looking for people that are analytical and are, and are broad thinkers. Um, so statistics degrees would, would certainly fall into that category in terms of what kinds of things you could do. Um, I'm gonna ask Jordan to talk about his experience. Jordan uh, started with us as an intern on the actuarial side. So he could talk about ways he uses 
um, and he used sort of the statistical foundation of what we do in, in his internship. Jordan? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so as Dan was mentioning, I started with Mercer as an intern um, back in my, between my junior and senior year of college. Um, I had interest in being an actuary at that point. I had started taking some of the actuarial exams, which as Dan hinted at, um, require uh, a strong background in, in math and statistics and probability. So, um, so definitely having a statistics background would definitely put you in the right place to start making progress on those um, if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, so my, um, my internship really was, I, I was partnered up with a, a full-time analyst right away. And basically week one was able to start working on real like real actual projects that the analyst was working on. Um, I did have some like training projects I was working on on the side, but um, I was exposed to real actual actuarial work um, pretty much right off the bat, which was really cool considering that your internship a lot of time is trying to figure out if you're going to like the work that you're going into. So the fact that you get real work right away and can kind of see what your career and what the projects you're going to be working on are going to start looking like. Um, that was that was really beneficial to me. Um, so a lot of the work I was doing during my internship was Excel-based and very um, very data driven. I was looking at um, populations within pension plans and doing things like projecting out um, projecting out people's benefits and projecting out costs for plans. Things like that, where um, it definitely satisfied my um, my love for math, and my love for numbers, and my love for um, digging into into data. Um, so that was really cool. Um, as an intern, I got to go to a client meeting, which was um, an in-person one at the at the client's organization, um, which was really cool. It was a really great experience. Um, kind of going into it, I didn't think that that was something I was going to get the opportunity to do because a lot of times when I think of when I thought of consulting previously I thought it was just like the most senior people on every team going and, and deliver, delivering the results but the fact that I was able to go along and actually present um, a few of the slides that I felt comfortable on that was that was really neat for me and um, gave me a good good perspective on where where my career or what my career would look like um, in the future with, with those types of responsibilities. Um, so that was really fun. I remember also having some, some fun group activities, like we had trivia nights. A lot of the, um, the interns at the time joined up with some full-time people and, and started a softball league um, or a softball team. We had a couple of, um, com of company happy hours in the office and things like that. So, um, Overall, it felt like the internship um, not only prepared me for the job and gave me a, a good taste of what I was actually getting myself into with, um, with accepting the full-time offer back at Mercer, um, but it was also just a lot of fun in general, and I, I got a good, good exposure to the company culture and the, and the, um, the fun people that, that work here. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Bill, I want to toss this next question to you because I know you... Uh, we wanted to give folks different perspectives here. So I know, Bill, you came to Mercer with some experience. You didn't work for Mercer as an intern, but one of the things, Bill, you're pretty active in is recruiting our interns. And so one of the questions that came in here is how much is an intern expected to come in knowing about investment consulting? Uh, so Bill, you wanna, you wanna address that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, so I, I actually joined uh, Mercer after having spent about two and a half years working uh, in a finance field, but it was uh, in, in for a boutique uh, place that, that did only healthcare related transactional work. So kind of uh, doing what our M&A group did, but from a you know, more of the, the driving the transaction part of the deal. Uh, and so I actually joined Mercer not knowing a whole lot about uh, investment consulting. And I think uh, what, I, what I've most appreciated about Mercer is that it is a place where there's a lot of really smart, talented people and a lot of um, you know, responsibilities given to you as, you as you prove that you're worthy of 
um, you know, trust. Um, but you, you can absolutely come in and, you know, know some of the basics of finance, know some of the, you know, you know have an interest in, you know, broadening your knowledge and you can pick things up really quickly. Uh, I, I was able to really come in, um, you know, having tangential knowledge, but, but really picking it up as I went along. And it's, it's an absolutely a culture where there are senior people all around you that, that are willing to give of their time. Uh, really, it's up to you to ask. Um, and I've, I've really found, you know, just in my own experience and from a career progression perspective, um, you know, so, sort of some of the best ways to learn is just to ask someone to teach you something and you can you know, not only do you learn from them, but they also tend to learn, you know, because uh, like they always say, there's, there's nothing like teaching someone to, to, to highlight what you know and what you don't know. Uh, and so I've found just a, a lot of experience um, you know, personally, as well as training younger colleagues and, and bringing interns in uh, to be that, you know, it's, it's really a uh, symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. And so, you know, when we bring an intern in, we don't expect them to know what we do for a living. We expect them to soak things up like a sponge, to ask questions and to, you know, bring their best self to work every day. And we kind of think that we'll take care of the rest. Uh, and so, you know, it's on us to teach them as much as it's on, on them to learn. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. I, I think that's actually a, a good segue into the next question. And I want to go sort of round, round the uh, round robin with the whole panel. Um, the question is, what are some skills, Excel, financial modeling, problem solving that would help us at Mercer? So, Megan, let me start with you and then we'll hit Jordan and, and Bill. Talk about um, the skills that in your role you use and what, what you see as helpful. Um, again, you could touch on these examples, Excel, financial modeling, problem solving, but, but other skills also not mentioned here um, that, that are important for you and what, what you have to deal with every day. Yeah, so I would echo what Bill said. As a new analyst, obviously it helps to have baseline technical investment knowledge. I mean, I am from a finance background, so I did have some working knowledge going into it, but it's so different reading about something in a book and taking a test and then actually applying it in real life. And then also, I mean, most people in most analyst roles, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things on Excel and do some modeling. I personally don't do modeling in my day-to-day -day job, but it is just beneficial to kind of know and understand how that works. Um, however, I would say the technical skills are important. Um, that's something you can develop on the job. Um, you may be a little bit uncomfortable at first, and you may feel behind, so you have to put in extra work initially. Um, but for me, I really only got really good at Excel when I started working, because it was something I was doing every single day. Um, so I think that stuff's important. But I would say, honestly, the qualitative software skills is really what um, will make you stand out at Mercer. Um, obviously, being an analytical person. Um, and enjoying solving problems, because as Dan mentioned, you're not going to have a cookie cutter approach to everything that's just not what your role is as a consultant or as a researcher. Um, and then another thing is just be open-minded. Um, one of the things that I learned at Mercer, and maybe this is true at other jobs, is you really have to put your hand up um, and be willing to be put into situations that you may not be comfortable with. I mean, Joy mentioned going to a client meeting the first time I was asked to present at a client meeting. I was terrified and I felt very unprepared. Um, but that's ultimately the way that you grow. And I think if you're not a little bit uncomfortable and feeling out of place, then you're probably not growing. And so that's a very helpful mindset to have. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I've been working for 25 years and I'm, I'm still in uncomfortable positions all the time. So the growth, the growth never stops. Um, Jordan, what about from your perspective? What are some of the skills that that you use, either technical uh, skills or or perhaps so, you know more on the um, on the softer side? Yeah. So from the technical side of things, um, as Megan kind of hinted at, Excel is really big um, in in our actuarial department. Um, I remember showing up during my internship and seeing someone navigating through Excel only using their keyboard and not using their mouse. And I thought they were, I thought they were a wizard at the time. And I didn't know, had no idea how to do any of the really complicated stuff in Excel that I now know how to do. 
Um, so as much of a background and a basis you can get on, on Excel that you can get early, that's great. Um, but sort of like Megan hinted at, a lot of that stuff will be, is, is something you learn on the job as you work with your colleagues and kind of figure out stuff and figure out quicker ways to do your work. Um, on the, the soft skills side of things, I think having a good, um, a good project management mi mindset and a, a, a mindset of really owning your work goes a long way at Mercer. Um, the, it's just a lot easier to work with people who find, um, who really take ownership of, of what they're doing and um, take pride in what they're doing. Um, that really, really shows that you care about what you're doing and that, um, and that just makes you an easier person to work with in, in general. Um, and then I think Bill hit on this a little bit, but really asking questions, um, whether it be to your colleagues or your clients, um, asking questions and, and trying not to, not to worry about the, the stupid questions that, that everyone still worries about at the end of the day. Um, asking those questions will really make you, um, really will help your understanding of, of topics as you're learning and going through, going through trainings as a new hire. Um, it shows that you're passionate and interested about what you're doing. Um, and as a consultant, it, it helps you understand and build a relationship with your clients and really, really learn what, uh, what drives them at the end of the day. Those would be the, the big three from, from me. Yeah. All right. Before I call on you, Bill, just a quick public service announcement, a quick reminder for uh, just throw any additional questions in the chat uh, that you want us to, uh, to hit on. Um, and you could cast your votes, by the way, for your favorite panelist as well, if, you, if you'd like to do that through the chat. Um, Bill, what skills do you, uh, do you find yourself using most? Um, perfect. So I guess uh, because everyone else is doing it, I'll, uh, I'll break, break them apart into like a technical uh, versus soft skills mindset. Um, so I'd say um, from, a, from a, an investment consulting perspective, um, what I find myself uh, doing often is, um, so from a technical aspect, I'm not doing a lot of the Excel work myself, uh, but what I am doing is trying to figure out uh, you know, tr I'm trying to reason my way through Excel files that other people have created, and I'm trying to oftentimes make sure the, the assumptions are correct and, and that we're, we're correctly entering data in. Uh, so, so understanding how to look at an Excel file and understand what drives it, what are the inputs, where the important things are, like where the important assumptions are, uh, I think is really important. So that's kind of a melding of your technical skills as well as understanding you know kind of the assumptions that go into anything uh and then from a soft skill standpoint uh i found you know two things that are that are really important uh one of those which is listening um for me when i when i joined uh a lot of what i did when i first started was just to take a meeting with anybody uh you'll find as a mercer consultant that that lots of people externally uh, are willing to take meetings with you and lots of people internally are willing to take uh, meetings with you. And so just being willing to listen to, you know, anyone from what, from a client to, uh, you know, some of the, the people who work with on the asset management side uh, to the internal resources we have available, just, just listening and trying to understand where they're coming from, what their perspective is uh, and sort of being comfortable in a conversation where you're not driving the conversation, but you're just willing to, to soak everything up like a sponge uh, is really important. Uh, and then, you know, it's kind of a soft skill, kind of a technical skill, but I, I think uh, writing clearly is actually extremely important. Uh, we work with clients often and we're providing them advice and you wanna make sure that you can, in as few words as possible, convey what you're trying to without, you know, being overly, technical without being like you know dumbing it down too much you're trying to, to hit that perfect mark of here's what you need here's why you need it and here's what we think uh, and so really being willing to sit down and you know draft an email uh, right away but then give yourself some time to think it over uh, being willing to write a memo up and thinking through you know what's the client's reaction going to be to what, my, what I'm saying so that you can anticipate questions um, you know, all of that I think is really helpful and it, and it helps build uh, sort of your own knowledge as well as your 
uh, ability to, to think about things from different perspectives. I think that's really valuable. Yeah, that's good stuff. So, so let me ask you guys to bring this to, to life a little bit. Um, I want to ask each of you what the most interesting or one of, doesn't have to be the most, but one of the more interesting projects you've had a chance to work on either can be something from your internship or something when you started as a new hire or something you're working on now. Um, so Megan, if you're good, let me, let me start with you there. Uh, what's the most interesting or one of the most interesting projects you've had a chance to work on? Mm, I, I'm trying to think. This one probably wouldn't be as interesting to, every, to everyone else, but this might tie in kind of the not so fun parts of my job and the parts that I really enjoy and also kind of relate to what Bill said about thinking about how your decisions impact um, everyone else. So as an associate, um, which I was recently promoted to, um, I now have ongoing coverage of specific investment managers who our clients are invested with. Um, so that's just a lot more responsibility than just supporting. And in March, as I'm sure many of you were aware, um, there's a lot of market panic going on. And one of the managers that I recently was in charge of um, kind of did awfully. And it was very unexpected because that is not what they were in the client's portfolio to do. Um, so understandably, um, the consultants panicked, investors panicked, um, and I was the go-to person to field all the questions. And I was really just kind of shoved into the fire there. And I was lucky because the researcher who was my boss, um, who formerly covered them, did provide support, um, but to a certain extent, because he was like, you are the main researcher, this is what the job is. And so for me, it was now reflecting on it, a great experience because I had to deal with consultants who weren't angry, but they just wanted to understand the reasons why so they could talk to clients. And I had to talk with clients who were just very disappointed. Um, and I had to speak at certain investment committee meetings and explain the reasons why um, this happened and also kind of help consultants form recommendations. Um, and just, it helped me understand that it's not that we just write our research and it gets posted and that's it. The research that we write does have an impact because it affects what our clients invest in. Um, and it's also really easy to discuss a strategy or defend a manager when they're doing well um, because everyone likes to talk about that. But it's a lot harder to present in front of a disappointed board and kind of justify our process. So again, for me, great learning experience. And it was also um, kind of com combined um, with the beginning of virtually working from home. So doing a lot of Zoom calls. Um, so I guess that was an interesting um, project for me um, in just terms of it was something that I never would have anticipated doing just a few years into my role at Mercer. I, I love that story. I think we all have stories about getting thrown yeah. in the fire and how, how quickly um, you know, we're sort of put to the test and how helpful that can be to the, to the learning curve. Yeah, and just um, to add what Bill said, kind of, because I realize a lot of my jobs with writing, really learning how to write concisely and not writing too technically, but just giving just the right amount of information um, is really important. And also realizing who ultimately is going to be reading it. That was another test for me. Yeah, that's great. Um, Jordan, most interesting project you've had? Yeah, so I think my most interesting project goes back a couple years to when I was probably probably one or two years into the job. Um, I was tasked with completing an experience study for one of my clients, um, which is a very, very actuarial, very um, data driven uh, project where basically what we do is take the, the last, say, five years of experience um, in a pension plan. So we look at um, how the individual employees have, have acted. Have they been staying in the pension plan? Have they been leaving and retiring and taking their benefits? Has their, has their pay been going up very exponentially? Has it been staying roughly the same? We look at different um, behaviors of the people in the pension plan and the, the um, underlying demographics of the people in the plan and basically compare what's going on in the plan to what our assumptions are to the plan. 
so that we can see whether or not our assumptions are lining up with reality. So it was a very, very large undertaking for me um, at first because I was, I was new to this type of analysis. I was still relatively new to the, the pension area um, in general. So um, it served as a very good stepping stone for me, learning a lot of the technical aspects of, of, my, of my job. Um, and my, my overall analysis ended up being put into approximately a, a 60 or 70 page um, presentation. So there was a lot of PowerPoints, um, presentation skills, and, and basically designing this, this material, which, um, which is, again, nothing I'd really done before. I had done a few PowerPoints in, in college, but nothing to this extent and, and nothing technical like this. So. Overall, it was a very, very great experience and a very good um, test of my technical knowledge um, at that point in my career. Um, and then it was one of one of my more major client meet, one of my first more major client meetings I went to, where I was doing the majority of the talking for about, say, maybe maybe forty five or fifty minutes of the presentation. I remember I I drank my water during the first fifteen minutes or so and just had terrible cotton mouth the rest of the the rest of the meeting but um but yeah it was a, a great a great project really enjoyed it and um it served as a great stepping stone for me yeah that's awesome um bill most interesting project uh so i'm gonna throw a curveball and say uh so my most interesting project was actually not uh, part of my day-to-day -day role as uh, an investment consultant, but uh, it was last year. Um, so as, as we mentioned previously, Mercer does a great job of supporting colleagues in what we call our BRGs, our business resource groups. Uh, and I spent uh, the previous two years ending in December of 2019 uh, as the co-lead for Mercer Cares, which is our uh, employee volunteering event or employee volunteering group, I'm sorry. Uh, and so last year, uh, the the head of uh, Mercer Canada and, and US uh, brought forth a, an initiative that's called Mercer Good Day. Uh, and, and the idea behind it was to, to plan a series of volunteering events uh, all on one day so that colleagues all across the US could give back to their communities at the same time. Uh, and, and last year, uh, given that it was the first year we had done this and that there was kind of, uh, you know, we were trying to find budget and trying to figure out what the, what the actual day would look like, um, meant that we had a really compressed timeline to plan all these events for. Uh, and so, you know, uh, myself and the, the committee that, that I was working with, uh, were in charge of planning volunteering events, uh, for as many colleagues as we could on one Friday in May. Uh, which also happened to coincide uh, with, you know, but our work schedules, um, the way our work schedules work is that May, August, November, and February are typically extremely busy months for us. Uh, so it was a combination of me having a lot of work to do on the planning and volunteering side, along with a lot of uh, personal work. But, but what we ended up doing, uh, pulling off was a, I think we had five uh, volunteering events that we planned on the same day uh, and we got I think over 200 colleagues to participate in it and we we helped uh, we provided snack packs and food for local homeless shelters I think we supported three local homeless shelters uh, we made uh, toys for a local animal shelter uh, cat toys and dog toys both uh, and and dog beds uh, we also made uh, we helped support a local charity by, by spreading the word, uh, and, and that was a charity near and dear to one of our colleagues uh, that has to do with providing support groups to, to individuals going through cancer. Uh, and so really just the most memorable aspect of it was working with uh, a large group of volunteers and organizing all of us to, to sort of give back to our community. And it was just a really inspiring, uh, great day. And, and, it, and it felt, uh, you know, like at the end of the day, you know, I needed to you know, sit down and sleep for about you know, 14 hours. But, but really what inspired me was that uh, just so many people were willing to take a part of their day and give back and that I was working at a company that supports that and that, uh, you know, there was just real buy-in from everyone uh, all the way from Beth on down to, to, you know, 
the lowliest of the low. So it was just really great uh, to, to do all that together. Um, so that was a, quite a memorable day. I just want to chime in here really quick that Bill did, and this whole team did a phenomenal job. I mean, this was quite an undertaking, and um, it really was uh, a huge, huge success um, and attributed to the leadership of the team that led it by Bill. So, and, and it just speaks to the kinds of people that we have, right? That what the, the yes, kind of people that exactly. are for Mercer is how we choose to spend our time, what's important to us. So let me, let me take that as a segue because you actually jumped in, Bill, and you answered the question I was going to ask next. So I'll just direct this one to, to Jordan and, and Megan, just Jordan and Megan in our last three minutes before we move to our close. What kinds of things do you participate in outside of work activities? Um, whether it's any of the BRGs or the you know, social activities, what are some of the things that, that you're involved with? Uh, Jordan, I'll start, start with you. Sure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, reciprocate what, um, what Dan and Beth said. The, the Mercer Good Day is a, a fantastic initiative. Um, and it was, it was just, it's kind of crazy to think about that many people working on, on, one good, um, on one good effort all at once. So it was really cool. Um, so in, in years past, prior to that, um, we, we would do um, more just like group office um, volunteering events. I remember a couple years back, back when um, I was sitting in the Chicago office. I don't think I ever actually mentioned this. I'm now sitting in the, the Milwaukee portion of, of Shiwaukee. Um, I remember we went to a, um, we went to paint lockers at a, a local Chicago school and um, do other other work around it. And I remember seeing um, the lockers go from from battered and old paint and kind of beaten up to these these brand new red red lockers. So that was um, that was really cool. Um, similarly, up in Milwaukee, we've um, we've made PB and J sandwiches for local um, local food shelters, similar to to what Bill was was describing down in the Chicago um, area. Um, and a, a, a part of my job that I um, that I enjoy outside of my my day to day um, client facing initiatives are um, I I volunteer a lot to mentor a lot of the new hires and new interns in my department. Um, they they still have a formal manager outside of me, um, but a lot of times I'll I'll try to kind of put my foot in the door with them and kind of make them or make myself known as being kind of like an informal manager so that if there's um, if there's any of those, I guess, again, stupid questions or questions they don't feel comfortable going to a more senior person who's their current manager, I, I try to stand out as the person that they can go to and I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to think less of them for asking a question that, um, that they feel like they should know an answer to. So, yeah. That's uh, a little bit about uh, a little bit about me. Awesome, Jordan and Megan. Any uh, last last minute thoughts on um, non work or non technical work things that you're involved in? Yeah, I'll just touch on them really fast. So the BRGs really are great. I'm involved with three. I do not lead any of them though, so not like Bill. Um, but yeah, I'm involved in Mercer Cares, Women at Mercer and then um, Rising Professionals Network, or Rising Young Professionals. Um, and just one thing, this wasn't directly Mercer related, but I did find it through Mercer Cares. I never actually got to start it because it was kind of during Corona, um, but I was gonna teach um, kind of financial literacy to kind of high school age students um, in inner city New York schools. And that's something that I probably will look to do virtually just because I think that would be a great way to give back while utilizing my talents. Um, and then also more just on kind of the fun side um, in the New York and in, in the Chicago office, just a lot of sports teams. So I was on a soccer team, a kickball team, um, and a cornhole team. And it was just so fun to get to bond with people. Um, I really didn't work with actuaries that much. And so just going on a Thursday afternoon or Thursday night, sometimes afternoon, um, was just really fun. And to get to see people outside of the office and really bond with people. Um, and being, I was been very impressed um, by how athletic some of the actuaries are. No offense, but. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, no offense taken, Megan. Um, awesome. So we are getting close to the top of the hour. I, I just want to close. Um, a huge thank you to the panelists, to Megan, Jordan, Bill, for, for sharing your experiences. Um, and uh, a huge thank you for, for Beth and Michaela for your, uh, for your um, comments throughout the presentation. Um, I'm going to close for one minute and then, Bill, do we have time? Do we want to show the, the video? Do we have time for that? Or are we going to... Uh, I said, I'm, I'm not sure we do. So I think we'll, we'll send that out in the, the roundup, um, okay. unfortunately. But. All right, excellent. So, so let me just close and, and then I'll ask uh, Michaela and Beth if they had any additional final thoughts. Um, with respect to, to the wealth business, we hope we gave you an opportunity to see what Mercer was like and in particular what it's like to, to work for the wealth business. I'm not sure that there are many other jobs out there uh, that so well combined the technical skills and the people skills together in a way with, with people that care, that care about making a difference, both at work and outside of work. Um, that combination of, of technical skills and, and the necessary communication skills and people skills um, are, is, is um, I'm just not sure there's many other jobs out there that, that really bring both of those together. And you heard a lot of it within the last 45 minutes or so, but you guys, you know, some of you asked questions about what's important. Um, hopefully we gave you a sense of what's important is obviously, you know, analytical and thoughtful, but in addition to that, it's about being open. It's about being inquisitive. It's about being curious. It's about asking questions. You don't have to come in and know a whole lot about being an investment consultant or being an actuary. Um, what's more important is to show that you're thoughtful, that you care, um, that you want to learn more, you want to contribute, you want to work with people. Um, that's those are the kinds of skills that that are important. So, um, Beth, Michaela. Any I, I was just going to jump in real quick and just add, um, you know, just wherever you guys land and in your career journeys, um, the one thing that I think is, in addition to what Dan said um, about the, you know, the skills and the um, talents that are really important, I also would encourage you to think about your adaptability. So I think that in this uncertain world that we have, the ability to be able to adapt and be nimble and, and flex when you need to um, and pivot because things are going to change whether we like them or not. And those people who can step up and, and drive through that um, are really going to lead our future. So um, I just would add the word adaptability. Yeah, nothing yeah. we're said these days. Yeah. So. Michaela, any final thoughts? No, I just echo your sentiments, Dan, and thank you, Dan. You did a great job. I swear I, I, you should be the poster child for Mercer, <laughs> for branding and everything. Your energy is infectious as, as it relates to Mercer, but I think that's, I think that's just as colleagues in the business, I, that's just how it is here. So I hope you guys felt it like I felt it. Um, anyway, again, be on the lookout for an email from me with some follow-up uh, documents that'll give you some more information about our opportunities and um, some of our, our links to uh, check out our culture in various platforms um, on social media and things like that and um, and the recording as well so again thank you all for your time have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll be in touch soon take care everybody thank you everyone